Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> we're a public company, so I uh, have to show a forward-looking statement slide. So we have filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission investors should look at. All right, <clears throat> so we heard some very interesting and I think accurate comments uh, just now. Now I've been talking about the IPO market and uh, Greg talking about uh, private you know, venture capital and so on. I remember one of Greg's points was if you're not going into phase three, if you don't have phase three clinical data and you're going to a venture <coughs> capitalist, get public. That embedded in that comment, I think, is a, is a situation, to put it mildly. <clears throat> the, many of us in this room believe, I think, with quite a bit of passion, that our country uh, in the United States and in the UK and many other countries around the world is facing the health care crisis. And I don't probably need to belabor it. I want to make this one point. You know, it's due to an aging population. And aging is replete with examples of chronic degenerative diseases that the scientific community believes some of these new regenerative therapies, remember this is how this term came to be, regenerative medicine, could make a major impact. And so here we have the scientific community saying, you know, we could cut the cost of health care and improve the quality of lives for many millions of people, and it takes money to do it. And we're hearing people like Navid saying, well, there's, there's a great IPO activity. Greg giving us a sobering assessment about the venture community. How do we push money into early product development? And specifically, I think the reason I was asked to talk about acquisition strategies is my background, uh, as Chris mentioned, is in the pluripotent stem cell sector. One of the earlier uh, or younger sectors of stem cell biology, but one in which uh, some of us believe could have a major impact uh, on, on this problem. And so how do we fund and accelerate product development in this space? Well, I don't have all the answers, but what I'm going to tell you is what we've been doing at Biotime. And the reason I'm going to talk about Biotime, it's my company, but secondly, I think we've been the most active company in the acquisition space in pluripotency. So I'll start with giving you some background about what we've done, walk you through why we've done it, and what I'll try to do is share with you some of the principles that we've found to be important in acquisition uh, strategies. I wanna talk about what I think are going to be some trends in the sector, and then I'll try to summarize that at the end. So biotime, biotime is a, uh, alluded to, its focus is pluripotent stem cell technology. We've currently acquired through a family of companies now over 600 patents and patent applications worldwide in this space. Largely focused, our products are largely focused on human embryonic stem cell technology. And some of these acquisitions that we've made, and, you know, of course, include in licensing of patents. Uh, s numerous companies acquired them in the last few years some of which I'm not showing you, one of which was one of Dr. Kaplan's uh, companies, cell targeting. Uh, but specifically in the pluripotent stem cell space, let's start at nine o'clock. Uh, ESL International was the company set up by the government of Singapore, by the Economic Development Board to fund uh, this research in Singapore. Uh, Biotime acquired that company from the government of Singapore. Uh, 12 o'clock in October of last year, uh, we acquired the, uh, all of the stem cell assets of Geron where embryonic stem cell research was born. Um, with the acquisition of ESL International at 3 o'clock, you see Cell Cure Neurosciences. This is a company based in Jerusalem focused on uh, primarily making retinal pigment epithelial cells for the treatment of macular degeneration and then at the bottom left, uh, about 7 o'clock there, Glycosan Biosystems was an acquisition we made to acquire some matrix technology, which I'll briefly mention. <clears throat> and then at the bottom right, uh, numerous other patent licenses and things, which uh, will include uh, from ACT and others. Well, let's start with pluripotent stem cells. Why the focus there? Well, 
uh, these cells, as many of you know, are, we say, pluripotent. <coughs> I've always called them, and by the way, it should be pluripotent. That's the pr proper pronunciation, but we all gravitate to the common denominator. And everyone says pluripotent. Um, pluripotency, to pronounce it correctly, is a remarkable property. Uh, not only can all these cells make all the cell differentiated cells of the human body, but they can make, as we've been able to demonstrate, which I had time to talk about it, uh, the intermediates between the pluripotent stem cell and the fully differentiated cell. And I think, at least this is a lot of our enthusiasm over pluripotency, is, is that cells in the embryonic stages of development have a remarkable plasticity and potential to regenerate tissues. The case in point is, remember by uh, embryonic stages I mean from the time of fertilization of the egg up to the fetal development begins. In that window, skin for instance in mammals, including humans, can do scarless wound repair. Something that a fetal or adulterized cell just doesn't naturally do. And we believe this is a property that extends to multiple somatic cell types. So being able to make these intermediate lineages of cells, uh, as well as fully differentiated cell types, has you know just there's literally thousands of cell types that can be made in a, from these cells. And the second point, of course, is another important point, which was alluded to earlier in the day, is the pluripotent stem cell can replicate indefinitely in the undifferentiated state, allowing you know literally an indefinite amount of product, so an indefinite amount of all the cell types of the human body. So that's why we thought this was a strategic area to focus our product development on. Now in terms of products that uh, we found uh, attractive in some of these acquisitions, uh, Geron had advanced the first product in the clinic made from embryonic stem cells. These are oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. And the Geron team, some, uh, Dr. Lepkowski will present here later today, was one of the leaders in this uh, at Geron and in the first ever human clinical trial, paving the way with FDA and, and, and laying out all the process development and the regulatory processes of taking this product in, into the clinic was a heroic effort. And having this product, which we believe has potential applications, not only in spinal cord injury, but other demyelinating diseases, uh, was, uh, we think, a, a very important acquisition for the Biotime family of companies. Now parked, as you can see, in the company called Asterius. Dr. Lepkowski would talk later today about another important application of, of embryonic stem cells uh, acquired from Geron. As you know, many of you may know, Geron began as a company focused on telomere biology, and Geron scientists discovered that the enzyme telomerase was abnormally reactivated in cancers. So over 95% of human cancers have reactivated telomerase, and they turned this into a, a vaccine antigen. And so what's VAC1, as it's called, or taken from patient-derived dendritic cells, was used in a phase one and a phase two study, which uh, Dr. Lepkowski will speak to in greater detail. And then VAC2 was also developed by the Geron team as an ES-derived dendritic cell technology to present telomerase in the context of multiple uh, cancer types. Another important product which we acquired is um, considered by many people to be the low-hanging fruit with pluripotency, and that's the retinal pigment epithelial cell. Why would it be a low-hanging fruit? Quickly and simply, the market and the safety profile and the ease of manufacture. So the market demonstrated by the anti-angiogenesis drugs, Lucentis and Ilea, age-related macular degeneration is a very big problem in an aging population and has, of course, serious consequences. <coughs> these drugs, these anti-angiogenesis drugs target the wet form of the disease, some 10% of the disease, uh, these uh, cells, RPE cells, could be used for the dry form. So a larger market, and these cells are easy to manufacture. They're a highly pigmented cell, easy, uh, easily made at 99% plus purity. And uh, cell cure neurosciences are developing this in partnership with the pharmaceutical company Teva. 
We have a lot of other cell types. Uh, we some technology we uh, licensed in from ACT includes the pure stem technology. These are clonal embryonic progenitors with many applications in medicine. We're targeting largely orthopedic applications. So let's go back to the pluripotent stem cell platform. These are important long-term therapeutic applications with large and growing markets, okay? One of the problems, and I like the sobering analysis that Greg gave us about you know, the markets and so on, one of the sobering realities that uh, many of us have feel, felt in the field of pluripotency is the long-term nature of these products. And so at Biotime, we've acquired technologies we believe are strategic and yet near-term products. I'm going to talk quickly about a couple of those. One is uh, high-stem hydrogels. These are cross-linkable uh, hydrogels, uh, typically using hyaluronic acid and collagen. So at the top left, you can see this material can be mixed in the presence of living cells and at physiological pH with no toxic byproducts, the cells can cross-link with these matrix components to make a three-dimensional structure so they can be injected through a syringe in vivo and safely polymerize with cells and with tissues, immobilizing cells and increasing their survival and engraftment rather markedly. And so there are over 100 scientific publications in this. We found this is an attractive acquisition uh, because of the near-term nature of these products. We're developing, as you see at the bottom here, Renevia is, we're seeking a CE mark in Europe as a cell delivery device, and we're using the product, the high-stem polymer, hydrogels, with um, autologous adipocyte stromal fraction for lipoatrophy. But we plan to make this uh, eventually the first FDA-approved matrix for the delivery of cells in general. In the U.S., we're currently seeking a 510K approvals for uh, a cutaneous ap uh, application we call Premvia and a tendon repair product we call Reglite as well. So here is a strategic product, but one in which we can generate near-term revenues for our company. We're also, in the pluripotent stem cell space, another pro uh, possible near-term uh, commercial application is using the cells in research. We're not using them in drug discovery. We're partnered with GE Healthcare, which does so. But instead, we're directly marketing our, our uh, embryonic stem cell lines and our pure stem progenitors and our hydrogels as research products through ESL International. We recently did, for instance, a deal with the state of California, uh, giving them the Singapore GMP grade human ESL lines to be used in dozens of the research programs underway funded by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. If they eventually lead to products, that would require a royalty-bearing license from our company. We've also acquired, uh, built, actually, within our company, uh, you see at the bottom, diagnostics. Using some of these stem cell um, technologies, we identified um, novel markers for, for cancer and have turned them into a diagnostic we call generically pan-CDX or a pan-cancer diagnostic. These are blood and urine-based um, antibody and PCR in the case of urine-based diagnostics for uh, a, a wide array of cancers. And we see this as a near-term, again, near-term revenue-generating product. Now here's a more imaginative example of how you can turn pluripotent stem cell technologies into near-term revenues. A few years ago, I presented here at this ter uh, Terrapin meeting um, that we had acquired Xenex. Have you, any of you heard of gene cards? There's a d database of genes. It's the number, if you type in a gene symbol on Google, the number one hit is gene cards, typically. Um, we acquired uh, the gene cards technology through this acquisition of Xenex and built around it other databases. LifeMap Discovery is a cell ontology tree of all the cells starting from the fertilized egg outward and all, all the molecular markers. Melicard is a disease database of over 17,000 diseases. And in one of those meetings a few years ago, and I'm not picking on you, Greg. He's nodding off over there. 
But I remember we had a Q&A session, and Greg says, how are you going to monetize that? Do you remember asking that question? And I said, well, you see. Well, here I'm, I'm going to tell you as one of our major strategies. We just announced uh, last week or so. Uh, first, you, we've got over two and a mil uh, quarter million users of this database, so you can see that there's opportunities to advertise products on this database and so on. But if you look down here, the markets in are, are prim have primarily been in academia, biotech, pharma, even patent offices. But the plummeting costs of sequencing the genome are opening up markets for the public and for physicians. And we just announced a really exciting initiative called LifeMap Solutions. It's in collaboration with uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. Some of you may know the scientist Eric Schatt. And uh, we're collaborating with Dr. Shad and Mount Sinai to, to develop an app for mobile devices that will be your gateway to big data. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the future. So we've set up these technologies in various disease-focused subsidiaries, uh, largely built, as I say, upon um, probably you know, more than 60% of all this based on acquisitions. Now, so I've given you a little bit of background about <clears throat> pluripotent stem cell op uh, technologies, their opportunities, how we've been trying to acquire some of these things and build, and why we've chosen some of the things we've chosen to acquire. Now I want to give some general principles about what I think is going on. All right, this is a sobering thought. It, many of you may know this. Uh, we haven't, I haven't heard it mentioned so far, but there is a huge trend underway right now in acquisitions in mostly larger companies uh, than Biotime to acquire profit centers and trash R&D. You guys know what I'm talking about. I don't want to name companies. This reminds me of, isn't there an episode of Star Trek with this, there's this big intergalactic machine that gobbles up planets and gets bigger and bigger. Do you remember these kinds of things? This is how I see these companies. Um, research and development even, late stage products even, are in danger in the United States. There's a scary trend underway. Um, in, for companies within the, more in the startup or the microcap type level, there are not many examples of near-term profitable businesses that can build, in, at least in this stage of pluripotency. It's easier with adult stem cells. Some of these adult stem cells, as many of you know, don't even require regulatory oversight. Much easier uh, path to profitability. Another important um, thing in merger and acquisitions I wanted to mention, because this is a thing I've seen scuttle a lot of deals, is if the strategy is acquisitions, be transparent. Uh, maybe it's an uh, obvious thing, but I've seen a lot of deals break up because people are, are, aren't right up front with the problems of their technology and or their company. It's always best to disclose that right up front. Another important little deal point and lesson in, in acquisitions is uh, I've seen a lot of uh, companies not do deals uh, simply because they assume that uh, a company has lost interest or so on, whether it be a large pharma company or a company like Biotime. The only way to get deals done is persistence. And uh, the adage here is get a no. In other words, get the other party to say we're not doing the deal. If you don't hear that, be persistent. Another piece of the puzzle here. The ultimately, what, what I'm talking about is the next five years. There's this trend away from research uh, stage companies. Uh, the thesis I'm developing here is, is that public companies like Biotime or other public companies are a path to liquidity for earlier private companies. Uh, a lot of the co acquisitions we've made are you know tired investors who want a can't get an IPO done, but they want liquidity, and so they're open to being bought out. 
and assuming that we have transparent and good disclosure and persistent negotiations, deals get done and liquidity happens. Um, ultimately, my belief is, is that the trend will be toward a, an embracing of many of these technologies which are still quite nascent, like pluripotent stem cell technologies, simply because of this. The most powerful demographic trend of our time is the aging of the population. This is the aging of the U.S. population, the baby boom, and I, maybe you know all these demographics, but the, you know, 80% of uh, aged Americans have chronic degenerative diseases of aging, and ultimately this is going to drive the one way or another the market, marketing of these new therapeutics. Another reason, ultimately, large pharma is going to be the acquirer, not just microcap companies like uh, a Biotime or others, is the attractiveness of the, as I said, of the market, but also the fact that these, m most of these products will be very difficult to generate uh, generics or biosimilars. Um, a lot of the manufacturing technologies are not uh, in the patent applications. The, many of these master cell banks of pluripotent stem cells uh, are unique genotypes owned by the company. So our acquisition of ESL International in Singapore was 90% was all about acquiring the clinical grade GMP human ESL lines that they had generated. And uh, Biotime owns that genotype, owns those cells. And so to generate a generic or biosimilar to that would be extraordinarily difficult. And so large pharma companies wanting a uh, product that doesn't uh, have all the issues of uh, patent expirations uh, would, would greatly benefit from that. So those are some of the trends I see in acquisition strategies for companies at our level. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.